Okay, we'll get started. Um, so our next speakers are Jason White and Craig Burton. Um, Jason is a Linux enthusiast and a law graduate and it has a PhD from Melbourne Uni in Contemporary Analytic Philosophy of Language. Uh, he's a Linux enthusiast and accessibility specialist and a researcher. Uh, in 2012, Craig Burton invited him to um, become involved in the Victorian Electoral Commission's e-voting project as a community participant. And today they're talking about e-voting. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, the purpose of the talk this afternoon is to discuss a very interesting project uh, that is currently being conducted by the Victorian Electoral Commission. I'll introduce Craig formally in a moment, uh, but I'd first like to set out the motivations uh, for this project. Uh, there are populations in the electorate who are unable to complete a conventional paper ballot uh, due, for example, to a disability. So uh, a person with a vision impairment, someone with dyslexia, for example, uh, or um, a motor disability that makes it difficult, uh, can't complete a conventional uh, ballot in the usual way. Uh, this creates a reason, therefore, to establish an electronic voting system which can allow such people to exercise the same right as everybody else, uh, namely to vote freely, privately, and in an independent way. Uh, there are limitations to uh, the state of the art in uh, uh, electronic voting as it has been deployed in practice. And I'd just like to point out some of those limitations and then to uh, make it clear in what respect we can do better. Uh, I've used some of the existing electronic voting systems in the past at, in both state and federal elections uh, here in Australia. Uh, they are certainly liberating and helpful. Uh, they enable me and others to uh, vote uh, without the assistance of another person. Uh, for example, a trusted friend or family member or uh, an electoral official. Uh, however, uh, this ability to vote independently by means of electronic voting comes at a cost. That is, uh, trust in a human being is replaced essentially by a trust in the technology, in the implementation of the voting software, in its proper deployment and its correct application. Now, uh, there are many ways in which intentional and unintentional bugs uh, and security vulnerabilities can be introduced into an electronic voting system. Uh, notwithstanding the very high uh, standards that are uh, upheld by state and federal electoral commissions in this country and in uh, many of their counterparts elsewhere in the world, uh, it isn't possible to be sure uh, that a voting system has been properly implemented and deployed, uh, that the software running on the machine in front of you is the same uh, software that's been subject to security testing. And of course, if the voting system is proprietary, uh, a, an extra barrier to entry is created in the way of members of the public and security researchers who may independently wish to uh, investigate the security of the system. Now obviously it can, uh, that, that particular problem can be resolved, it's possible to create a free and open source voting system, uh, but the problem of trust in the technology, as it were, is a much more difficult problem to resolve that requires more complex and sophisticated solutions. And what I, what I found out, uh, having become involved in this project in various of its aspects, uh, thanks to an invitation from Craig Burton, is that the state of the art in the security research and in uh, research surrounding electronic voting uh, by cryptographers and others in the uh, security field is actually much more advanced uh, than the systems that are currently deployed in uh, state elections around the world. And so uh, Craig Burton is the e-voting manager at the Victorian Electoral Commission. He has extensive prior experience in the design and implementation of uh, voting systems and he's going to uh, introduce the rationale for the project uh, and then outline how the project works, provide some video demonstrations and uh, I'll be adding some comments uh, along the way in relation to several aspects of the project. So. All right. Um, thank you, Jason. 
Um, I was introduced, introduced to Jason by no less than Donna Benjamin, who's the winner of your Golden Pliers Award. So, <laughs> right, yeah. Maybe they were um, golden once. Um, I, I called the talk e-voting you can taste. Of course, I'm, I mean to say, can we provide e-voting that's kind of tangible and convincing, something that actually provides really meaningful proof that it's got your vote um, as you intended it to be cast. Um, I didn't mean e-voting you can taste as a new kind of voting system that you operate with your mouth. That's not very um, The talk I'm going to basically open by stating what I see to be security problems that are intractable in e-voting. Um, then I'll say, although it seems to be insecure, but it can't be secured, why would we want it anyway? And there are some good reasons why we want e-voting, and um, um, Jason has alluded to them. Um, I'll then introduce concepts of um, verifiable voting. Perhaps some of you in the audience know about this through the literature. Um, but for those who don't, I'll explain it. Um, verifiable voting impacts on the voter experience. So it's a changed voting ceremony somewhat. Um, and I'll show you some examples of the voting ceremony in this, in this environment. I'll say a few words about remote voting, by which I mean unsupervised internet voting. Um, because that has come up um, in our project. We're not uh, legislated to do it in Victoria, but also I'm going to describe it as, as being uh, really too risky. And I'll kind of end with the beginning, which is the, what we call the V-Vote project, Verifiable Voting Project in Victoria, um, and talk about what we're aiming to achieve when, uh, for what, and for whom. Okay, so basically um, I want to start by saying, obviously, that um, if E-Votes are electrons, this breaks just about every um, stable and established method of scrutinising elections. Um, if elections are run on paper, um, mutually distrusting people who have no technical skills can stand and look at the election and look at each other and be confident um, that votes are moving around the right way and that voters' votes are being captured. The voter themselves gets to see the marks that they made. I'll talk at least in the realm of people who are able to use paper voting initially. Okay. Um, in, in paper voting, if I want to um, pinch a bag of votes and somehow take them out of the election and change them, I need to do that on a vote by vote basis. And if I want to change more of them, I need to involve more people. Um, we call that a retail attack on an election. It's retail in the sense that the more damage I want to do, the more people and the more systems I have to involve and doesn't scale very well. Um, in contrast to that, um, in, in electronic voting, there are many opportunities for basically one monkey to stop the show. And we call that a wholesale vulnerability. So a wholesale vulnerability is where, um, let's say you vote for Jill, um, you choose Jill on the system, Jill ends up in a row in a database, this is the simplest e-voting system I can think of. Um, therefore, anyone who can access the central tabulator has the ability to flip dual votes to jack votes. Okay, so that's what we call a wholesale um, vulnerability. It turns out that um, just about all the risks in paper voting are retail risks. It's a 150-year-old system. It's had 150 years of debugging. It's fantastic. And most of the risks are very well known. And Generally speaking, it takes a lot of effort to cause a large effect and with a large uh, probability of being detected. Uh, unfortunately, in e-voting, just about all the risks are wholesale. So when I'm explaining this to my commissioner, they're saying, well, if a, if a bag of votes goes missing, isn't that like someone entering the system and changing a few votes in the database? And unfortunately, you just can't compare the risks uh, in e-voting to the risks in paper voting. So this project um, seeks basically to take a step back and look at the qualities of the paper system and try and bring them back to e-voting, all right? Okay, and I'll say for a minute there, you know, does the Russian mafia want to um, hack into the result for, um, you know, the Belkanen uh, district election? Do you think so? Probably not, right? Um, but it turns out that in Victoria, um, the first prize for winning the Victorian state election is $40 billion, okay, because that's the state budget. Now, of course, it's not completely true because then you have to become the government, <laughs> but it's the kind of prize that has a certain amount of street cred attached to it. 
and I think it would be irresponsible to assume that elections and e-voting are always going to be too boring and not interesting enough for uh, troublemakers and for um, political and monetary gain. So I feel that it's certainly a, uh, it's a target worth protecting and a substantial prize, at least in the minds of people who want to cause trouble. So I'll finish this slide by saying that voting is really not like anything else. People say to me, oh, you know, e-banking has solved these problems you're complaining about, okay? You know, they lose money if they get hacked into. They've invested all this effort in e-banking. And there really are, there really, there really are, there's nothing to compare between e-banking and e-voting because I would say that um, IT security as such is broken by voting. In e-banking, if you put 100 bucks in your account, the bank knows you've got 100 bucks, you know you've got 100 bucks. If it disappears and goes to Nigeria, you'll know, and the bank can insure itself against that kind of thing. Um, the Electoral Commission isn't actually even allowed to know what your vote is on a person-to-person -person basis. We can't even know what it is, um, let alone tell you what it was. Um, we have to treat your votes collectively. And so all these good inventions in in e-banking and in other sectors, um, ordered transactions in databases, right once media, all these things work against us. Um, and I think that makes, that makes voting completely unique and very, very difficult. All right. Okay. So, it sounds too hard, but is it? Um, this is our shopping list of things that um, we would like to provide. In fact, the Geneva Convention obliges us to provide equal, fair, open, safe um, elections. And it turns out that there are a large group of people um, whose needs are not met by paper voting. Up to 400,000 people in Victoria, for example, um, don't have functional English that's good enough to read a paper ballot because it's only in English. They may have attentional disorders. They may have um, disorders to do with shaking and such that they can't mark a paper ballot. And so it ends up being quite a large group. There's also the kind of the promise of an e-voting system where you might be able to drop in as a voter and see or hear a candidate speaking. So it, it sort of suggests eventually one day a kind of a rich voting experience, a, a deliberative voting experience. So it's a very attractive idea. Um, and then of course, if it's a networked application, it'll have great reach. Um, if it's automatically counted, it has great accuracy. And of course, it's modern. But I just want to stop here and say, it, there are some things that do not automate well. And although it is very attractive to be modern, and there's this pressure on government departments to be modern, um, voting is so different and so special that um, when someone says to you, oh, I waited in line to vote, and I got, out my, I got out my iPhone, and I did some trades, and I emailed somebody, and I got a few texts, and I updated my Facebook page, and then I stood in front of a cardboard booth, and I took a pencil, and I wrote sequential integers on a piece of paper. Um, it sounds utterly absurd, but elections are that special. And what they do, and what they elect, and what, what gears they turn are so special and so important, um, I think that this is something that should not be automated so much so quickly. I think that um, I should say something about internet voting. And it's no small irony that um, there's the Oscar elections running at the moment for the Academy Awards. Right, I wrote that software. That's what I did. So, uh, and, but now I feel that that is, that is too risky, that approach, for public elections. Okay, in the mid-2000s, it felt like it might have been possible, but um, I now think differently because I work for a commission and I see how they manage their risks and I see the military way that they organise themselves and um, I think it's too risky. And when I say that, there are wholesale risks in internet voting that can't even be measured. Um, E-voting has wholesale risks. We control all the systems, we control all the networks. We can at least measure the risks. But with internet voting, obviously, we don't control the network. We don't control the end device. Um, we can't fully control the user experience. And so there are risks that we have to deal with <coughs> that, that can't be known, that are unknown. 
Um, and probably the simplest one is that we can't provide services. We offer a whole lot of people internet voting and the systems come down or are taken down and there's a gap. And that, that to me, is completely new in serving elections. Um, I'm going to talk to you soon about verification and verification looks like a kind of a minor miracle and people immediately say to me, oh, if you can do verifiable e-voting, why can't you do verifiable internet voting? It turns out that it makes it, 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 makes it worse in some ways and, and I'll explain that a bit further on. There does remain, however, an argument that for people who can't attend and vote and for people who can't use postal voting, um, how do we provide them with an election experience? How do we provide them with secrecy and privacy? Okay. Being able to vote on a machine with a screen reader at home on the network would seem to be a way to deliver them um, a vote. If they don't have any in secrecy and privacy to begin with, uh, you know, they're not going to be losing those. And if we can make it verifiable and they can use the verification system, you know, why not do that? And a reason I would give for that is that we can't enforce um, subscription to these services. So if we say we'll collect 5,000 internet votes, we're not going to go around to people's houses and check their eyesight and you know, enforce them being eligible. Um, to me, there's already a precedent for the overuse of special voting methods. For example, postal voting and early voting were introduced just for people who couldn't come on election day. But now a third of all our votes are taken those ways. A third, enough to flip every single result, right? So I am worried that um, internet voting would be wildly popular. In fact, I can just about guarantee it would be wildly popular. Um, but I think that it's the wrong direction. And that's, you know, but then I'm not the electoral commissioner, so I have to respect the goals of my commission, but my general advice is um, no. Okay. So Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. Sorry, yeah. No, 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 please. Uh, sorry, I'm just interested, you didn't mention there what seems to me the most fundamental problem with, with remote voting, which is the issue of coercion, which you really can't. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that, no matter how good your systems are, no matter how unbreakable they are, which they never will be, but even if they were, yeah. you still don't... Um, you know, you've still got this fundamental problem of, of voter coercion. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, it's true in postal voting too. You can, you can choose to have a private vote, a secret private vote, but the question is, in fact, it's the state's job to make sure you have a secret private direct vote um, in the polling station, right? Um, so it's questionable as to whether, you know, how secret and how private it needs to be unsupervised. Sorry, you are going to... Gentlemen over here. Can I, just Sorry, Can I just comment on that, and I was going to raise this afterwards, I don't want to sidetrack too much, but I was in Norway a couple of years ago and listened to a few talks where they were actually going to be running their real federal elections in just some trial areas as full internet voting. I'd really appreciate your comments, whether you know about it and how that experience has gone. Can I just say they specifically talked about the issue of conversion and selling or selling your vote, and the solution they took is, yes, you can sell your vote, you can vote, and then you're allowed to vote again. So you can sell your vote again and vote, and you can sell your vote again and vote. It's the last vote that counts. So unless someone is locking you down, the system allowed multiple votes and used an, an out-of-channel SMS um, back channel, so it wasn't purely internet to address some of the issues. So there were some interesting solutions there. I'm just letting you know they exist. Um, I can comment on that system. It's, it's Christian Ball is the project manager for that, and um, I think it's a good start, but um, the understanding of, of the academics I work with is that the ability to re-vote makes it unverifiable, ultimately, or breaks some important properties of the verification. Um, plus, you can only gain proof that of how you can't, you, can't, you can gain proof of how your vote was recorded, but you actually can't gain any proof from that point onward. Right. I'm just keeping an eye on that time. Um, yes. Okay. So. Um, I'm going to quickly say that verifiability is not a new kind of firewall that you install in the rack. It's, um, it's a, really a paper process. It's almost, it's almost completely a paper process 
um, that runs on top of the voting system. But in fact, it uses cryptography, but it uses cryptography in a way in which you can prove the cryptographic operations you've used. So people say to me, oh, well, the internet voting, I, I voted home and it encrypts my vote on my machine, and then it sends it down the line, but you've really no proof of what gets encrypted. So if we're going to use encryption, um, we have to also provide proofs. Okay, I'm sort of skipping ahead here. Um, a cost of this approach is that voters need to do new things. And in a minute, I'll, I'll um, show you a few artifacts of the scheme that we're using and some videos of people um, um, attempting to use them. Okay, but a good outcome of it is that it is possible to gain proof of how you voted and it's possible for people with the right tools to gain proof that every single byte in the election was handled properly. Okay? So the voters end up being, the vigilance of the voters ends up being where all the action is. There's no people within the commission who solely understand what's going on. It all boils down to the voters, the things that they do. And I'll say last of all, perhaps not surprisingly, um, this will be a free open source software project. That's its plan. But it doesn't have to be free open source because we're taking the position that we don't trust any part of the voting system at all. So no machine, no person operating it. So the jargon would be this is an open system which could be proprietary or free software, but it's an open system. Well, it'll be this, the system in our project will be free open source software. But I'm more just- Normally an open system, whether you implement it free software or private, the system itself it, it, is open. Well, if you apply, um, if you build a verifiable voting system, it could be entirely proprietary, but it has to issue proof that's convincing. And that has to be open. Yeah. And the, the default position we're taking is that we just don't trust the machines and the people operating them. We still need really good machines and we still need really good people, but there should be no single point, um, no single person who's exposed by the design. All right. Um, before I show you the videos, which move quite quickly, um, I'm going to explain what it is that takes place. And at least in this slide, I'm assuming that voters have vision and they're able-bodied. We will collect these verifiable votes from people overseas, as well as um, people with barriers in Victoria. The voters marked off as before. So you walk into a polling station, you say your name, your address, you provide whatever proof there is, you say you haven't voted. That's outside our system. It could be done electronically, uh, could be done off the marked register. Then, um, the voter is printed one of these. Okay, I'll put this up on the screen in a minute. Um, but this is a list of all the candidates that are on the ballot so I can vote. Um, there's a small group at the top for the Legislative Assembly, which is our lower house in Victoria. There's a little group in the middle, which is for parties. I'm picking a single party because we have a split ballot system um, in most states of Australia. And then there's a big list of candidates at the bottom I don't want to pick a party if I have to pick uh, five or more candidates. Um, people in here wondering about how we're going to do this in the federal election, um, or in fact in New South Wales. In the federal election, there could be 100 names here, and in New South Wales, there's 330 names. Um, you can rank them from 1 to 330. Yep, that's what you do. <laughs> so I don't, I don't have a smart answer for how long this piece of paper should get, what the font should be, uh, how small the letter could be, or if it could be done in another way. Um, but for now, I'm aiming on making it work in Victoria. So I printed one of these. It has two QR codes. They're both the same because they'll be presented to a machine. I might have it around the wrong way. I need the machine to read the QR code to know that it's these candidates. Okay. So this is called a candidate list. It has one thing that's visible to voters that's unusual about it. This ordering of candidates here is not the legal order. Okay. So Frank Dean is the first person on here. It's very likely that Frank Dean isn't the legal order, is not first in the legal order. And if I vote on screen, uh, 1 to 10, so if I donkey vote, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 5, 10, um, a printed representation of my preferences that comes out be in a different order to this, so I'll explain that in a second. All right. Okay, so after I finish voting, the voting machine spits out its own list, and these are the preferences that I've created, or the voting preferences, and I line them up 
that we can do with that. Um, I might show this on the screen to be clearer, but the numbers are not 1 to 10, starting at the top there, 5, 4, 9, 8, 2, 6. I can leave the voting station with this, because it doesn't have the candidate names on it, and the preference order is shuffled. Okay? And to cut, a short story, cut it down to a short story, VEC has the ability to restore the order of this receipt and count it as a vote okay, via cryptographic stuff in the QR code. So, that's a very, very brief summary. Sorry, Artie. Uh Why do we have to have... Sorry? Why do we have to have uh, two separate pieces of paper? Why couldn't you just have one? Because at the moment, what you basically mark has the candidate yeah. name on it anyway. Okay. Why, why split them, create more complexity and create doubt in the mind of the voter? The reason for that... <laughs> the reason for that is that this can't leave the voting station. Okay, so this list, which is the candidate list shuffled for you, is destroyed. Okay, and the receipt you take home... Again, why, why would you need to do that? Why wouldn't you leave an audit trial yep, with no, the actual... Great, it's a great question. It's, it's fundamental to the protocol, actually. It's, it's, the protocol is called Predivote, and um, separating out the preferences to take home as the receipt is the key to retaining some proof of how you voted but which cannot be used to prove how you voted to anyone else. Okay? And if you turn it sideways, it could just be treated as a number, a receipt number. But it has the beautiful quality that it's your preferences. Okay? But I'll get back to it. So just let me get through this. Okay, so what I've got up here is a video. Um, let's fire it up. Okay, so what I have here is a video of the first prototype of the system. Um, it shows these two lists initially joined and then the voter rips them in half, but it's basically the same. And then I'll show you the incarnation of the later version of the system. All right. Okay. So the voter's been marked off, and now they're walking over to us, to our system. This is a demonstration of running a polling station. After being marked off, I walk over to a print station where a VEX staff member looks up my district on the print station software and makes a request for a voting slip to be printed for me. This is the candidate list. Because every voting slip is different or the district may be different, these slips are printed on demand. I take my printed slip over to the privacy booth. In the booth, there is a voting tablet and a ballot marker set up for me. I insert the slip into the ballot marker at the right it's cropped and it's quickly scanned. This reveals that I have a vote for Northcote and the tablet is told to provide me for ballot, with ballot paper in Northcote. I click to start voting. I'm given two ballots, the district ballot or legislative assembly. On the screen it looks very similar to the paper ballot. I scroll with one finger and I can place my preferences in my order of preference next to the candidate names by touching the boxes. So this if I want information, I touch on the candidate's name. So I'm just going to number it one to six, right? This also gives me access to that candidate's how to vote card if they have one. If I see the how to vote card on the screen, I can actually touch to have that how to vote card be my legislative assembly vote. Instead, I return to the ballot and I number it by hand. If I go out without touching all the boxes, it warns me I only chose three candidates of six. I can then go back in and provide the remaining preferences to make my vote count. All right. I can now visit the upper house, a legislative council ballot. I have two choices. I can vote above the line for a party or group, or I can number five or more candidates below the line. I choose to vote above the line. First, I read some instructions on to confirm my vote. And here I'm shown uh, the list of candidates in the Legislative Assembly in the order that I numbered them. On to the, to the scan station. So, shown here is the same alignment that I produced on these two slips. Um, created differently, created with overprinting, but again, um, I voted 1 to 6, but I end up with 2, 3, 6, 4, 5, 1. Um, and then I can, um, in, this, in this incarnation, separate the slips and leave. Okay, so we've come a bit further than that. 
and let me <coughs> let me show you the playlist. Are we going for time? Okay. Right. Sorry about this, folks. time. Um, okay, so I'll play the signal. Um, I'll turn the audio off. So this is the latest version of the system. The slip, as I showed you, is being placed on a QR code scanning target. All good? Not good. So similar to the previous um, incarnation, except that um, it's been marked up to use gestures, um, different device. Um, but the same process is there, except this time the voting machine has its own printer. So instead of marking the ballot, um, the voting machine prints. Probably, I'm just going to cut ahead because I can see that we're running out of time. Um, I'm going to play you the um, audio version of the system so there is, um, in anticipation of blind voters, a um, completely dark version of the tablet application. Welcome to the... Right. Yeah, you could. But I'll, because it's on the video, I wonder why it does this. Okay. 2014 Victorian state election. This is a gesture based system. You will be guided through the voting process by making selections on the screen using your fingers. You will first practice all the gestures now to learn them and hear what they do. When you are finished, press and hold four fingers on the Okay, so the idea is to use the same tablet, the same device that's used for visual voting, to also provide gesture-based voting. And those two buttons you can see on the screen there, you probably can't read them, allow someone uh, who works in a voting station to flip the view of the tablet from a completely audio representation of the ballot to the marked ballot in its visual view. So if a, if a voter's, an unsighted voter is having trouble, there's a means by which a fairly unskilled, ballot, uh, unskilled um, voting centre worker can come and assist them screen for two to three seconds to move to the first stage of voting, the Legislative Assembly ballot. The swipe down gesture will help you move in a downward direction through a list. Place a finger on the screen and swipe it from top to bottom for about three to four centimetres. Swiping up allows you to move up a list of items. So they end up with the same lists as the um, sighted voter has. Um, but they drive the entire voting experience by just swiping the screen and touching the screen. There's about five gestures in total that they have to learn. Um, if they struggle with that or they have uh, motor problems or fine motor control problems or they're shaking, there's another interface again which is 12 telephone buttons and they sit on top of the screen. Uh, it's a special kind of electroconductive silicon and they activate touch areas on the screen. So there's an Australian standard called the Telephone Voting Standard which defines what you should do. Okay. Is there any reason you can go straight to that? Or is it just slower? What do you mean? Straight to the phone thing. Um, we will offer both. Um, the, phone, the phone thing is slower and harder. Um, it, is, it doesn't have, um, well, there's a lot more keys and not many people are familiar with the standard yet. Um, so we're hoping that the vast majority of voters will use the swiping system. Um, so for those of you before who couldn't see it, these are the two slips and sideways you can see that that list of integers there could be a receipt number. Okay, so it serves both purposes. Um, if you are have no sight, uh, it would be rather difficult to see these lists. And so the, any voting device in an early voting centre will be able to rescan both of these and read back the vote to the voter while they're still in the voting centre. Once they leave the voting centre, this has to be destroyed. Any person can read this back to them without knowing what their vote was. 
Um, probably the hardest thing that a blind voter must do in this verification system is remember that um, they would need to remember the position of, of some of their most highest number, lowest number of preferences because um, they can remember that they voted one for the Greens. Um, they can remember that the Greens were perhaps third down in the list of the official ballot. But here, my one for the Greens is in the top position. So I have to actually remember that. Or I ask um, someone who has sight to help me. But the idea is I need to be able to get through this um, entirely with the machine, entirely with machines, um, or without help from another person. But I do, I do need to remember where those preferences are. Okay, so I'm going to talk now about the public information that's available from this system and the audits that a voter can do. So the preferences list being shuffled, it's possible you might say to me um, when you arrive at the voting station, you might say, oh, okay, so this, is, this isn't the actual legal order and then later on you're going to reverse my preferences back into the right order. How do I know my one for the Greens? isn't going to end up being a one for the some other party. You know, prove it. What's in that QR code? Is my name in that QR code, for example? Um, and there's a challenge that you can, that the staff will be trained to serve, wherein the um, encrypted order that travels with your preferences um, is broken, and a report is issued along with a proof of the encryption that shows that, in fact, this is the shuffle order that was captured in that QR code. Um, and any phone can read the QR code to see what the rest of the garble in there is. And that will be printed out as well. Um, the idea being that um, you would then need to get another one of these to vote. You can't audit one of these and discover the encryption, uh, encrypted shuffle order, and then vote it, because then you would be able to prove how you voted to somebody but you can then request another one of these and then you could then audit that if you thought that the system might be waiting for people to get the second one and use it and so on until you're satisfied that these shuffles are correct. Okay, so that's the first kind of audit. You check your printed list as I've explained. Um, when you've voted, this thing that's emitted by the system, this preference list, includes a signature from the VEC of your preferences in this order. So, it would be desirable for the sceptical voter to confirm that we have this list of preferences in that order and that it's signed by us. So that can be checked with a phone application, an offline application. <laughs> Once you go home, you can take this home, you can log into the, our website and see the same, pretty much the same stuff online, um, along with a commitment from our system that this and all the other receipts obtained in one day's collection are all there unchanged. So we sign them all and publish that on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, finally, and I'll actually even I'll defer to um, Jason here, people who are interested in this, election geeks, if I can use that term, um, can actually obtain proofs of the encryption that we've performed and the decryption that we've performed. So at the end of the day, when we unshuffle your list, okay, and we, put, we get your preferences as you cast them, um, we issue a proof that we shuffled all those receipts first and we issue a proof that we decrypted it properly. And it's done using a cryptographic mix net and proofs and actually Jason has done this. I haven't done this, but Jason has. Yeah, there, there is publicly available uh, software which implements this, uh, not on a real election of course, but on a, uh, some sample data and uh, it's possible to compile it, run it under Linux, it will generate the keys uh, uh, the public, uh, sorry, the private key material can be uh, distributed among a number of mixed servers, which in principle can be uh, held by mutually distrustful parties, and then it simulates the process of actually uh, generating the data, uh, carrying out the mixing process, which uh, shuffles and re-encrypts and finally decrypts all of the uh, messages so that the order of arrival information is uh, eliminated and uh, from one stage to the next it's not possible to create any kind of correspondence between the encrypted uh, votes 
at one stage and encrypted votes at the next. And then at the last step, they're all decrypted so they can be counted in the usual way. Uh, and the software uh, generates uh, proofs at each stage uh, so that uh, uh, you can verify that all of the cryptographic operations have been carried out correctly. Um, and uh, as I said, the simulation uh, can be run on a single machine or you can do it on several and it will uh, run through this whole process for you. Uh, there are different implementations around of the uh, proof verifier. Uh, there can be very easily different implementations of the mixed net and uh, that allows people to be assured that uh, all of the cryptography that's carried out once the votes have been recorded and made available by the web-based bulletin board uh, is performed correctly and the votes are then counted correctly. All right. Thanks, Jase. Um, and finally, um, you can satisfy yourself with the actual design of the system by looking at the source code, but that, as I've said before, um, although that's a good start, it doesn't represent um, any kind of very strong proof of what the system is that's running. Okay, so in summary, what's good about this? Um, you, Susan Voter, can prove to yourself that the VEC got your vote as you cast it, okay? Um, but you cannot prove that to anybody else. Um, everybody else can prove that Susan's and all the other votes were included as they were cast, but they cannot, this cannot be checked individually. So at the end of voting, we end up with an enormous collection of these receipts up on the web bulletin board. And as one batch, they are processed, decrypted, and the plain text are omitted. And we can prove that that was done right. Okay, it's using Verificatum, which is an established mixer. Um, as I've said, you, election geek, um, can check these proofs. So there's publicly available tools to look at mixnet proofs to see that we in fact did correct, uh, decrypt them properly. Um, and then hopefully, um, other people who want to cause trouble can't change very much without being detected. Um, of course, it's a big claim, but um, if you rely on the voting system to tell you if things are wrong, then presumably that part of the voting system can be hacked. So this layer of verification is outside of the voting system, functionally outside of it. Just about out of time, yeah. Okay. Um, I would like to quickly say that although this stuff seems um, pretty desirable, we don't get it for free. Um, an important quality in this system is that we don't really know how many people are going to check their receipts and do the other checks that I described to you, but it needs to be the case that they're easy. Otherwise, someone looking down on this system for ways to penetrate the system um, will go for the assumption that if the verification system is too difficult, or there are certain classes of voters who can't use the verification, then those votes are more easily changed. So whatever verification we offer, it needs to look easy, it needs to look like people are going to use it. Um, some of the tests that we do do need a good number of people to do them. So the comparison of the two lists, we expect most people to do that. Um, another big trade-off, we think, is the technical design, which is, is enormously complex. If we don't want to trust any one device, um, we don't want to trust any one operator or any one person, we need distributed systems. Um, I'm probably out of time to show you our network design, but the central system that collects our votes is 15 distributed machines, 15 peers. Um, so they're right there, 15 physical devices, where in conventionally voting you might have two centrally. Um, there are some things that are made worse by verification. Um, and there's an attack called chain voting. It's actually worse with verification because the attacker has proof that um, people are voting the way he wanted them to, but I can't go into that. Um, our project is to deal only with early voting, so we won't be automating the entire Victorian election in one hit. Therefore, the traditional guarantees of integrity apply to the rest of the paper votes and our votes are either counted um, electronically with keyed in paper votes from the VEC, or they're counted in a hybrid count with hand counted paper votes. So it's still a bit of a kludge, but it anticipates eventually being the majority method one day in the future. And I suppose probably the, the biggest thing or the hardest thing to justify in verifiable voting is that 
if the verification system starts to show that there has been some trouble, um, some damage to votes or there has been a hack, we can only recover from that in, in conventional ways. So we can't know which votes have been damaged. We can segment receipts by date and time. Um, we could look at devices that created voting receipts and isolate receipts on that basis, but the point of verification is not to actually show you specific damage to votes. And I can say that there is um, a nascent research field called recoverable elections, which is starting to think about cryptographic protocols which can restore an election that's damaged. Okay, but it's very much a, an emergent uh, research field. Sorry, sir, you had a question? No? So I think we're almost, we're out of time. Okay, I'll have to exit there. Thanks very much to Craig and Jason. I'll just put, I'll put one plug in. Um, there's five universities involved in this project. Um, and anyone who really is an election geek among you, who really wants to know more about this, or thinks they can help us or contribute or is interested, please approach me. Um, we, we're asking anyone who's interested to take part in this. Thank you. On behalf of Phoenix uh, Australia,